not a jungle gym, they can do that outside. But we want to make sure we keep the house of the Lord clean and respectful. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 through 9, what it reads, it says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Somebody say servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled, me, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also, where rather God also hath exalted, highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. And we know that name is Jesus. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. And if you have it. Say amen. 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 So we'll start at verses 22 to 24. Servants, obey in all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Last verse. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. I'm going to talk or teach from this subject tonight, having a servant's heart. Having a servant's heart. I'm going to teach this tonight. So I want you to pay attention to this and let no one distract you. We don't want the saints to be distracted because we need to have a servant's heart to do what God wants us to do in this city. Let us begin to pray and ask God to help us. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for all that you've done. We give you glory, we give you honor and praise. God, we thank you for allowing us to be in the house of God one more time. But somebody did not wake up this morning. Somebody did not see this day, God. But you gave us mercy and you gave us another day, Lord God. And we're taking this opportunity to come and be in the house of the Lord. For we know that you're soon to come. So God, all the things that are keeping me from not being out of the house of God, that's stopping me, God, from getting close to you. I know that sometimes, God, we say, God knows my heart, but God, you said our heart is wicked. And who can know the heart but you, Lord God? So, Lord God, I don't want to give you an lame excuse, but I want to walk up right before you. And the only way that I can do that is I must hear the word of God. Father, not for my own self, teaching my own self, sitting at home and looking at TV, Lord God, or trying to open up the book myself. But you said, he that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has said. And you said, Lord God, how can my faith be built unless I come and hear the word of God? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I pray that you touch our heart tonight, God, that we will all leave here with a servant's heart, oh God. Let there be conviction in this place, oh God. I pray in the name of Jesus, fill somebody with the gift of the Holy Ghost that has has not experienced the Holy Ghost. I pray that they will be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins and they will have a repentful heart before this message is out. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we bind every spirit of distraction that comes to hinder the word of God tonight. And Lord God, we ask that you will feel your will tonight for our lives. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help your vessel right now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Clap your hands as you're being seated and tell your spirit of neighbor, we must have a servant's heart. Hallelujah. Having a servant's heart. You can pay attention to the monitors because the scriptures will go there. And the reason why is because we don't want anybody leaving here saying that preacher or that pastor or that man said this. Well, no, it didn't come from me. I didn't write any of this. But we want you to read it for yourselves. That's why we have monitors. Nowadays, people don't read their actual Bibles, but sometimes people bring iPads. I use that and sometimes, but I still always hold on to my Bible. I must have my Bible. And sometimes people bring on their phones, but I guess sometimes in the house of God, people pull out their phones, but they probably are either texting, emailing, or Facebook. But we want to make sure we pay attention to the Word of God so that you can get this lesson. Amen? Amen. And so tonight we're talking about this subject calling having a servant's heart. 
So before I get started, what's the definition of a servant? Well, let me give you the definition of that. A person who performs duties for others, especially a person employed in a house or on domestic duties or as a personal attendant. A devoted and helpful follower or supporter. And so when you look at this definition, I'm talking about us in the house of God. We need to be devoted and helpful, a follower and a supporter of God's will or God's word. God counted on 12 men to deliver what? The word of God. In the New Testament, we have the 12 disciples who we know also as the apostles. And God chose these 12 men to do what he wanted them to do. We read about the Great Commission. And they were to go out and do what? To teach the people, to witness the people, to baptize people, to let people know about God's will, what God wanted to do, that God was coming back, to let people know that God loves them, and let people know that God wants people to be saved and to repent. And so there was a commission. God wanted them to do something, and they would have to go out and serve. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by serving? Serving meaning that I am catering to you, whatever it is that you have need of, whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that God wants to give you, God is using me as his messenger or as his servant to deliver that unto you. Nowadays, most people will say, well, no, God is going to just do it. Well, if that be the case, then you will say, well, then why did not God just make the ark instead of telling Noah to do it? God always chooses men, man meaning man or woman, human kind, mankind, to do what he needs them to do on the earth. Why? Because God's word said that he gave men dominion on this earth. That would mean that if God gave mankind, you and I, humans, dominion on this earth, the only way that God is going to operate anything on this earth, he has to use mankind. That's why you see the devil. The devil knows that as well. So that's what that devil will do. The devil, that spirit, will get into people and use people to do the divine things that he wants them to do. So no alien or no spirit can just walk around here without a body or without a human body and walking around just as when we walking around because they will be considered an alien. And so when God gives us the word says man have dominion on this earth, that means as also in the wickedness or evil as well as good, they are using a body to do that. Which is why our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came in a bodily form. He knew that he could not just come as a spirit. God is a spirit. And so he knew that he could come as a spirit, start walking around, dying on the cross and shedding blood. Why? Because a spirit doesn't die. A spirit doesn't shed blood. So what did our God do? He took up on the form of a man. He came as a man and we know him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when it comes to a servant, God is wanting us to be a servant. I asked in Sunday school, have you ever gone to a restaurant and experienced bad service? Anybody? Just by the show of hands. Have you ever gone to a place where you experienced bad service? Well, I've gone to many places, and most people will say, if I experience bad service, I'm not leaving no type of tip. I'm not giving you anything when you haven't came to my table and brought me something extra that I needed like silverware. Or you ain't came and you ain't took my order and it's taking hours for you to come over there. I'm not giving you no tip. I'm not doing that. I've gone to different places. Every time I walk into Walmart, I have to remind myself, you're not at Target. You're not at Target. You're not at Target. I don't know about you, but I love Target better than I love Walmart. You might say you love Walmart prices, but Target or Target, how people want to call it, bougie people call it Target. But when you walk up in there, it's something different when you walk up in Walmart. Why? Because the people are sitting at the end of the aisle saying, you can come right here. How about I help you? Is there anything you need? And Walmart people will walk around doing stuff and they ignore you. Talk about what? Go on over there. It's over there somewhere. But you know how you get it at Walmart. Even when I go to McDonald's, I have to remember I'm not at Chick-fil-A. When they're at Chick-fil-A, I look my sister's lap in her hands. You already understand what I'm saying. At Chick-fil-A, when I can be there, I can see a long line. A long line. A long line. But I still get up into that line. Why? Because I know everything is going to move real smooth. When I get up in that line, they always tell me, I'll tell people, I like giving them my money at Chick-fil-A. I like just giving my money. I almost want to give them a tip, but I forget this is a fast food place. But when you get up to, up to Chick-fil-A, they say, how may I help you? And then when they take your money or take talk to you, they say, my pleasure. I'll be like, for real? You like serving on me? You like that? Man? You, go to, you go to McDonald's, hello? <laughs> <laughs> yes, what you want? <laughs> we ain't got no more fries. <laughs> But this is what we get, and nobody likes that. 
I don't like to go into a restaurant and the service is bad. I don't like anybody doing it. But our Lord and Savior, I think about that and I go back to this. When you come to the house of the Lord, think about coming to the house of the Lord and just people just, no hospitality, nobody cares, nobody doing nothing, everybody's got an attitude, nobody's greeting you at the door. You walk in and somebody said, when you walk in the door and anybody said nothing to you, you don't know where the restrooms are, you don't know where this is, you don't know where that, and nobody cares. Who wouldn't want to come back to that house? So when you come to the house of the Lord, I want everybody to come to that door to feel welcome at home and feel like, you know what, I'd like to go back to that. Because the first impression means something. Amen? Amen? The first impression means something. If you give me the wrong the idea on the first impression that I meet you, I'm not coming around. I don't think I'm going to come back around. I will give you a second time. So before I can even get them to the water, before we can even get them to the altar, before I can even get them to the pews or to the seat, it's going to start right at that door. It's going to start. That's why we can't just have any greeters at the door. I just can't put anybody with an attitude standing at that door. Why? Because you'll scare them off. Why? I say, I didn't see you next time. You know why? Because that person that was at the door, they had an attitude. They act like this and they act like that. So we got to be careful of what we do or our impression or our posture towards those who are coming to the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 And so this is what God is teaching me about having a servant's heart. I learned this. I, I set up on their pastor and I set up on the bishop and I begin to watch them. Here is this man that pretty much he has a lot of different churches and he's he's gone out, he's taught, he's traveled, he's done so many things. He has degrees, have all these things, and none of that means anything to him. Because anytime you get around him or you get around Mother Davey, his wife, the first thing they're asking when they walk in, you would think that you would say, hey, Bishop, sit down, go ahead and sit down. But the thing he's doing, he says, what can I do to help? As a pastor, I should never, or a pastor should never get to the point where he's the pastor, I sit down and everybody do something for me. The devil is alive. Because the pastor has to be the number one servant in the house. Amen. He has to be the one doing everything. He has to be on his knees scrubbing. He got to be cleaning out this baptismal pool. He got to be wiping down walls. He got to be the bus driver. He got to clean toilets. He got to do all of this. I'm doing all of that. I teach Bible studies. I go here. I go there. I'll pull out money out of my pocket. What do you need? If I can help you, I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to do whatever I can do. I got to be the number one servant. But nowadays, you got people riding around in jets and limousines getting out right there on a red carpet and all that stuff, walking in like they some special somebody. That's why you got prophets walking around talking about, I won't prophesy unless you give me 20 Gs. I won't come to your church in this place. You trying to charge people to give a little bit of work? The devil is alive. We all must be what? Servants in the house of the Lord. And Jesus Christ was the chief servant. Why? He came. Our Lord God came in the form of a man. And what did he do? He served. We're going to get into this lesson about being or having a servant's heart. Number one, let me show you some things. I'm going to give you three points tonight. The greatest servant is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The greatest servant is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 through 28. Look at what the word of God tells us in Matthew 20, verse 26 through 28. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be a minister unto, to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Do you understand, and I talk to people, about what Jesus did for you? Sometimes we don't know. That's why it's hard for people, when we say praise God, people give God a golf clap. Right. That was a nice one. That was good, God. That was right. That was good. People give God a golf clap. They just praise God. Why don't you praise God? Hallelujah. That's it. No, no, no. If you realize what God did for you, you will give him greater than that. You will praise him from sun up to sun down. But many people don't understand what God did. Many people just feel like God was supposed to do that. And that's how we get sometimes. God, you're supposed to pay my bills. And you're supposed to do this. And you supposed, God ain't got to do nothing. God ain't got to do nothing. He ain't got to give you no money. He ain't got to supply nothing for you. But it's just because he's a good God. That's why people got the soul. I serve a good God. I serve a great Done this, and God came down. He said, You know what? If I don't come, 
There was nobody that was perfect. Only God is perfect. And so that perfect God came, formed himself in the flesh of a body. And what did he do? He began to minister. He began to show people. He began to love people. He began to do all of these wonderful things. And he died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood. The Bible says that when they pierced his side, out came blood and water. They put thorns on his head. They beat him. They flogged him. And if anybody understand about flogging, anybody understand when they whipped him, what they had? They had lead balls on the end of them. They had like scorpion tails at the end of it. That every time they whipped Jesus, it wasn't just like a whipping that we get with the stuff out of the tree like my mama used to do me. But when they were whipping him, they were actually the, the flogs or the, the way we go into his skin and rip his skin out from his side. And blood is being shed. They would just beat him. The back, they would beat him and beat him and beat down the, 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 the thorn on his head. The Bible says that when they beat him, that they beat him so bad that they did not, they didn't understand him. When they looked at him, they were wondering, is that a man? That's how bad they beat our Lord and Savior. That they beat him so bad that his face was so disfigured that you couldn't even recognize if he was even a man. But we just read about it or we'll hear about it and we'll be like, oh, he did? Oh, he did that for me? Oh, okay. Praise God. God be the Lord. No. For somebody to do that for me, I don't know anybody in here right now that you can sit there and say, I will do it for the next man. Especially if you know they're just going to be wicked and evil. If you knew for a person that was going to be wicked and evil, a person that would probably steal from you or kill you or kill somebody in your family, would you die for them and go do that for them? There's nobody in here that can raise their hand and say that they'll do that. But our Lord and Savior did it for us. He did it for every person in this world. And I know people got denominations talking about he only died for black people or minorities. The devil is a lie. He died for everyone in the world. All that time, he died for every one of us in this world that you can have life if you choose to have life. So now you want to say, can I live? Can I have you saved? God said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The question is, do you believe? Will you believe in him? And so this is what our Lord and Savior did. And when I think about Jesus, it's always talk to me. I talk about it on Monday night about the perfect man. Jesus Christ, the man that walked upon the earth. The Bible says God with us. This, people, this person right here that we talk about, Jesus Christ was the perfect man. There are some things when I read about Jesus and I say, man, I don't, I'm not there yet. I, I, I want to get there. But I, there's some things that God does that our Lord and Savior did that I'm like, man. I'm not getting there yet. Let me just give you one. When I begin to think about it, I begin to read the word of God. I want you to look at Luke chapter 6, verse 32 to 36. When I look at the scriptures and I put it in the NLT, make it very simple. If you love only those who love you, this is something that I look at Jesus Christ. He's a perfect man. I'm trying to get there. We're trying to be like Jesus. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. You know how we love. I got love for my people. But my neighbor next door, I fight them in the bed. My neighbor next door or my friend next door, this person that stepped on my feet or did wrong to me on Facebook or talked about this. You know, I'm ready to go ahead and go off on them. I'm ready to do something. But he says, and if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? This is the perfect man. This is how Jesus was. He's the perfect man. Even sinners do that much. Look at what it says. That even sinners do that much. We're trying to be more like Jesus. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to others. Sinners for a poor return. This is how this perfect man is. And I'm trying to get there. Our Lord and Savior was a servant. But look at some of the other things that I want to point out to you. Look at what he says. Love your enemies. Can anybody right now, you can say that you have an enemy. Anybody have any enemies or have a had an enemy? Let me just say that because I know we all been born again. All right. We all say now nobody will raise their hand for that. But have you ever had an enemy? And during the process of them being your enemy, have you ever turned around and you say, you know what? I love you. Not a lot. Okay. All right. That's one. Okay. Do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. I don't know if anybody ever lent anything to their enemy. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. 
for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. This is the perfect man. You must be compassionate as your father is compassionate. This lets me know as a servant. I used to be a waiter. And I worked at Denny's, Denny's restaurant. I used to, I did that in high school. And in high school as a servant, I got some people that were not so pleasing customers. I'll put it like that. Some customers that I wanted to kind of make a concoction for. I'll tell you like that. It came a time when I walked into the table, I mean attitude, everything, to the point my mindset was like, I don't even care if I get a tip. I don't care because you have. But the same thing I feel like now today, God was trying to teach me how to deal with people. Because people are what? Fickle. People will love you one day and hate you the next day. People will talk about you one day and people will do this. But God is not telling us to be a servant or to help those just when they are doing good, but to help those even when they are doing wrong or wicked to you. Just be a servant. Just be compassionate. Just be somebody that will help. But don't get an attitude when somebody walk around with an attitude and you say, I'm a big, I'm going to show you what it's like to have an attitude. I'm going to show you what it's like. Because what God says, I can't use that. Because think about it, as a pastor, I'm going to deal with all, a whole bunch of different people, different attitudes, different personalities, different backgrounds, different lifestyles. And if I can only deal with certain lifestyles, then that means everybody else. I don't care about how can I be a pastor. How can you say that you're a child of God, but you only caring about these particular people? How can you say, I love people and I love God, but you don't love the white man or the Chinese man or you don't love the yellow man and the, and the brown man, but you got just particular people. I'm only caring about the Haitians. I'm only caring about those who are Jamaican. I'm only caring about them. There is no love in your heart whatsoever. And God cannot use that. And you cannot be a servant in the house of the Lord. That would be like you said, I'm going to be a person, I'm going to work the altar, I'm going to be an altar worker. But you see certain people, you're like, no, I ain't praying for that, but I'll pray for this. We ain't got time for that. And God ain't moving nowhere, and it's all to no way if that's like that. So what God wants is a church of people, a body of people, of believers that believe and love God. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for people that love God. I must be a servant. Even Jesus did things that many of us would not want to do. But he was the what? The king of kings. Look at John chapter 13, verse 4 through 6. Look at what it says to us. I want you to see this right here. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did things that we would not do. But watch what the word of God said. Make it simple. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Next verse. And poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. I've already lost the majority of you when I said wash feet. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Look at what he said. Go to verse 7. Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. Right now, if I told everybody, listen, we need to start being a servant and wash each other's feet. People already, my brother already look at me like, man, I wish I would. <laughs> I wish I would touch somebody's feet. You're going to have to show me that in the Bible. God going to have to give me revelation and understanding. And an angel going to have to come and talk to me before I do that. Before I think about doing that. But look at what our Lord and Savior did. Our Lord and Savior. The reason why he washed feet. This is the reason. Back in the day, in the Bible days, they would walk wherever they went. And so wherever they went, and you see what they wore, they didn't have no sneakers like we have today. They didn't have any, you know, or clothes in shoes like we have today. But they had sandals. And so wherever they went, they would always have dirty feet when they come into a place. And so this particular day, God began to tell them to sit down. All of the servants, all of the apostles, sit down. And what did our Lord and Savior do? He began to get a basin of water. He began to take the towel that was around him and kneel down right before the apostles. So he began to kneel down at their feet. And when he began to kneel down at their feet, he took the basin of water to begin to take their feet and put it in the basin and begin to wash their feet. Now, some brothers were saying, well, man, I ain't trying to touch another brother's feet. I'm going to let y'all tell you I'm a real man. I love my wife. I love my wife. But at the same time, my Lord and Savior did this. How can I think that I'm greater than he is? How can I say that I'm greater than he is? 
And so in this church, yes, we do have foot washing. In this church, we do have communion. That will be starting here. We did it in Tampa. They do it all over. But in the word of God, God tells us there's some things that we need to remember. And there's some things that we need to do. There's some things that we must do. Communion, foot washing. There's some things that we must do in the house of the Lord. For you to say, this is a real church. For this will be a real church, there must be the Acts chapter 2 verse 38 message, which is repent, be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What's another thing? Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's what we must do. We must always be consistent. We must not waver back and forth. We must preach truth. Another thing we must do, we must praise and worship in this place. There must be praise and worship in this place. In this place, we must walk the right but we also do what? Foot washing. We serve one another. We also do what? We take communion. I know people talk about Christmas and everybody remember Jesus on Christmas. But Christmas is not here in the word of God. What God tells us the thing to remember is what we are to do with this communion. We do what? We take the blood as we drink that. That is a like of the blood. We also break the bread, which is breaking of his body. Do this in remembrance of me. This is what we do. And this is how you know it's a real and a true church of the living God. Right. We witness, we outreach, we do all of these things that the word of God talks about. We lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We, put, we, put, we take the oil and we put it and says, go to the elders so they can pray for you. This is what we do in the house of the Lord. And so when you see Jesus washing their feet, go to verses 12 and 16. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? He's asking them a question. You call me teacher and Lord, which Lord means master. Everybody say Jesus Christ is my Lord and my personal Savior. That's what they say. That's how people, so churches talk about. That's how you get saved. The devil is a lie. You never can get saved. I'm so sorry. We'll put that nugget in there. Nobody can ever be saved saying, I accept Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. People teach that. People say that. That is not in the scripture. Do you know preachers around you preach that? That's not in the word of God nowhere. Ask them where they get that from. They, act, they try to get it from Romans chapter 10 verses 9. That is not what that scripture is saying. They say, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Jesus said that we must repent. So where is repent in that, in that whole saying? Jesus said we must be baptized for the remission of our sins or the removal of our sins. But if all I'm doing is saying Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior and that's it, then how are you saved? Because where is there in the water? Where is the repentance? And where did you get the Holy Ghost? And none of that in that. But people claiming that they're saved and they're Christians because they accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. But that's not in the scripture. So my question to you, do you believe the scripture or do you believe some man? I really just believe the scripture. Let God be true and never man alive. But here in the word of God, look at, go back to it. He says, do you understand what I'm doing? You call me teacher and Lord or master and you are right because that's what I am. That's what Jesus says, I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet and you are to watch each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. You see that scripture? God says, I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. So if you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to follow him. Why? Because he's my example of how I should be. The man Christ Jesus that walked on the earth, this is exactly how we are to be. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master. If Jesus is your master, he's your Lord. Nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. That's why I'm never trying to act like I'm more important than Jesus. Or what I got to say is more important than what God got to say. Whatever I do and say, it must come from the word of God. If I'm adding anything to this thing, that means my name is going to be taken out of the Lamb's book of life. So let us just do, or let us just walk up, and let us just be servants as the most high God. Amen. So the greatest servant... Or the example we have is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Which leads me to my second point. A servant is hospitable. A servant is hospitable. Has anybody ever gone to a hotel and they just didn't clean up the room? Have you ever gone to a place, a hotel, where they just didn't clean up the room or wasn't clean to your expectation? 
Well, I've been there, and I've warned the people, I went back there, changed my room. Changed my stuff. No, I did bed. I don't know who stuff in this bed. Y'all don't seem like y'all cleaned it. Y'all did this, y'all did that. That's why sometimes you got to stay at those five-star hotels or those four-star hotels. Because if you go to go in and motel six and all that, then you're going to get what you get. You're going to get what you get. But when you go somewhere, I want to go to a place where they're hospitable. That's how you should come to the house of the Lord. When they come here, people need to say, man, that place was hospitable. They treated me really nice. Nobody was rude. Everybody was nice. But I didn't really enjoy that. They kind of, they knew what was going on. It wasn't chaotic. It wasn't crazy. It wasn't no people doing this and doing that. You know, some people go out church right now and people call themselves deacons, but they'll leave right out and they'll go start smoking. The deacon is outside smoking, drinking, his little drinking his red cup. All of this stuff happens and all of this stuff happens, but it should not happen in the house of God. What we need to do is be hospitable. We need to let people know that we are really saved, that we ain't just talking stuff, but we actually are doing stuff that can show people, yes, we are saved. Why? Look at my life. I'm not trying to be on broad paths and be showing that, hey, watch me, watch me. But just let my light shine. Just let your light shine. I'm not a, a pastor that's sitting there saying and preaching one thing, and then the next day I'm cursing. I'm not a pastor that's talking about, here, I'm a Christian, but I'm doing this, but you talk about Christians curse. That's a devil is a lie. I'm not a pastor or a Christian talking about, I listen to this type of music. Why? Because it's love music. No, it ain't. It's R&B music. I'm not a type of pastor or Christian that walk around talking about, hey, I go and do this, or you know that I'm lucky, or I'm going to Take up my Holy Ghost and I'm going to handle my business. I'm not a type of Christian that talk about I get high on the weekends and I go to a club, pop them up, and I'm taking pictures of selfies and I'm doing this and they come to church the next day, raising up my hands, singing in the choir. I'm not that type of Christian. I'm a real Christian. I'm a real saint of God. And people look at me, I don't think I'm so saved. Yes, that's right. That's what we are. Yes, we are saved. Yes, we're real Christians. Yes, we are real believers. Yes, we really go to church. Yes, I stay in the house of God. Yes, I pray. I believe God and I believe His word. I serve the real God. I don't know what God you serve. So the Bible gives me an understanding of what we are to be and how we are to be as an example. And so if you don't want to word of God, I always tell people, and I tell you like this, if you don't want to believe this whole thing, I say to you, why even have it? People have Bibles all over the place. But if you don't want to believe this thing, throw the book in the trash. If you don't want to believe the whole book, just get rid of it and write your own. It probably will be an easier book. Because if I wrote the book, it'll be a lot easier. It won't be this big. It won't be have these many chapters. I give you two chapters and we'll be done. But it's not my book. So I tell anybody, if you don't want to believe everything in the word of God, throw it away and write your own. But if you say this is my book and this is the bread of life and I love God, then why don't we do everything? Ezekiel, prophet said, eat the whole roll. Right. What does that mean? That means when I'm eating or I'm taking or I'm hearing this word, there's going to be some stuff that's going to rub me the wrong way. Right. It's going to be bitter. But there's going to be some stuff. I'm going to say hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to shout. Because I like those. I like the blessings. And I like how God is going to work it out for me. Yeah, you give me this and give me that. But when you tell me I got to live right, when you tell me I can't do this, when you tell me I can't shack up, when you tell me I can't go here, when you tell me I need to look like and I need to walk like, when you tell me I need to be a woman, I need to walk like a woman and look like a woman, when you tell me I need to be a man, an upright man, a God-fearing man, I need to walk in God is my example, when you tell me I got to do certain things, I don't like that. So people will pick and choose what churches and what pastors. Why? If I go here, I like what he says. Because he makes me feel good. That other one will be making me feel bad. Because I just feel like, no, the other one, with this one right here, is making you get your life together. I need a preacher that's going to help me get my life together. And if you're going to get my life together, I need to get the good and the bad. I need you to tell me what I need to do. I need you to let me know, even if I don't like it. Pastor, preacher, tell me. Tell me what I got to do. That's why these prophets today are lying prophets. Because every time a prophet came in the word of God, what did they do? They said, thus said the Lord. Thus said the word of God. Thus said what the Lord said to do. This is what the prophets did in the word of God. But nowadays, as I said, I'm going to keep saying it. Prophets and these so-called preachers today are blessing everybody. Everybody's sleeping around and everybody cursing. Everybody's shacked up and everybody lying. And everybody's smoking and everybody's stealing. And everybody cheating on taxes. Everybody claiming socials that's not their kids. Everybody doing all this stuff. Everybody doing on and on and on. And he's blessing everybody. Laying hands and blessing everybody. Everybody going to heaven. Just say it in sinner's prayer and give me a check. But that's not a messenger from God, no That's not a servant from God. 
going. You need that preacher to tell me what I got to do to be saved. And how does God want me to live? Is it in the scripture? Yes, show me. I want to read it for myself, which is why the Bible tells me in John 5, search the scriptures. For them you think you got eternal life. Let me just do what the word of God. And God, he shows me as a servant. And he was hospitable. There's some things that I want to show you about the word of God. Look at the Old Testament in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8 through 17. I know that's a lot, but I'm going to read it real fast. Look at what I'm trying to tell you as being a servant. When you are a servant, let me show you what comes back to you. Let me show you how God uh, blesses you when you are a servant. One day, Elisha, look at the word of God, went to what? The talent of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. We know Elisha was the man of God. He was a prophet. After that, whenever he passed that way, he was stopped there for something to eat. So this lady just began to say, hey, Elijah, the man of God. Hey, hey, Christian. Hey, 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 Sam, why did you stay at my house? Look at what the word of God. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Look at what she's doing. She's taking her house and rearranging and adding on to the house. Why? Because when the man of God comes through, she wants the man of God to stay right with me. It's an example, not about a man staying with you. I'm not walking to your house trying to stay with you, no way. What I'm trying to show you, that every time this man of God will come past her house, she will say, you got room, come on up in here. I got a place for you to stay. It's not that I want God to just come by every once in a while to this house. It's not that I just want God to visit this house. But what am I going to do? God, I'm going to set up some stuff for you. But, so that you can do what? Stay here. I'm going to set it up so you can stay in my house. I'm going to make sure that this house is holy. I'm going to set things in order to make sure that there's light. I'm going to make sure there's a worship. I'm going to make sure there's praise. I'm going to make sure that every time you come here, I don't want you to come past MLK, look up in here and be like, oh, they ain't got it together. There's some saints that ain't repented and keep moving. I want God, when the Spirit of God, when there's a kind of glory, I don't want it to pass by, but I want it to sit right here. And so she says that he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day Elijah returned to Shulam and he went up to his upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shulam I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elijah said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate your kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? He can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elijah asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Look at what it says. Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man, which means that she was barren. She didn't have a child. And we know that only God can do what? Deliver a child or give you a child. And so she's barren. She doesn't have a child, but she's wanting a child. I wish I could have a miracle and I'm looking for a miracle. I want a miracle. I know you're probably looking for a miracle. Some of you need something done. Some of you need your finances worked on. Some of you need a job. Some of you need housing. Some of you need some blessings. Some of your family need some things. Some of your father and your parents need some things. So here is a lady right here. She said, I need something. I need something that only God can give me. So my brother, man, you can't do this for me. I just want to help you because there's something about you that makes me want to help you. But look at the word of God. She says, no, my Lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me. But look, at, let's go back to it. She called her back. Elijah told him. When the woman returned, Elijah said to her, as she stood in the doorway, this is what she was saying when she didn't have a child. Next year, this is what the man of God said. Next year, at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. She wanted a child. Back with the scripture for me. She wanted a child. Next year, at this time, she said, call her back again. Elijah told him, when the woman returned, Elijah said to her, as she stood in the doorway, look at what it says. Next verse. Next year, at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. This is what she said. I want a child, but you, man of God, are telling me I'm going to have a child. But are you telling me the truth? That's why sometimes people go to church and the word of God is going forth 
And when the word of God goes forth and God is trying to say something to the Holy Ghost, there's many people in the congregation saying, I don't know if God will do that. You think God will bless you like that? You think God can help me get, but I'm in a bad thing though. I'm in a bad situation. Which means you need a miracle. But you're saying, I don't know if God will be able to do that. And so she said, man of God, don't deceive me. Don't get my hopes high. Don't make me start thinking I'm going to have a child with no man. But look at the word of God and what it says. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elijah has said. How did this happen, people of God? Because in her mind, as the man of God was coming, she said, you know what? There's something about that person. And she began to build a house so the man of God could stay there. I promise you, if you will start taking up on your stomach and say, God, I want you to I invite you to my house. Amen. I want you to invite you in my life. I want you to be in my life. The miracles and the things that you have need of, God will say to you, I'll have it for you. I'll get it for you. But what we want God to do is what? God, we want him to be a Santa Claus. Answer all my prayers. Do everything that I want to do, but I still want to live my life. And God says, no, we can't do that. That when I bless you, that my blessing towards you is for you to turn your life around. I'm giving this to you so you can see that I am the miracle worker. I am the one that you have need of. I am the one. I am that I am. That's what he said to you. That whatever you need, I'm the one that supplies. But why don't you invite me in? He's a God that will not push his way into your life. But when you want him to come in, you got to open up the door and say, God, come on and stay right here. And whatever you to do God have your way. I'll praise you. I'll bless you. I'll get my right life right, God. I'll love on you, God. I'll do as you say. I want you to just stay here, God. And when you do that, you will start seeing the blessings of God overtaking you in your life. Amen. This is just not some little pretty sermon, but God is trying to talk to you tonight. That there's some things that we must do. And the one thing that I'm talking about tonight is having a servant's heart. Doing for others. That when you do for other people, God will bless them. That's why sometimes you might see homeless people. I don't give them money, but I'll say, my brother, are you hungry? Come on with me. Let me go get your sandwich. I'll do certain things like that. Because if I do it to the least of them, God is going to reward me. What? And openly, he's going to show me. I don't tell people that I'm fed people. I don't tell people that. But I just do it. Why? Because I'm caring about certain people that God says, son, I want you to do this. I want you to pay some groceries. Have you ever been in Walmart in line where somebody was standing? I heard it like this. Where you're in Walmart and you're standing there and you just sit there and say, uh, ma'am, do you believe in Jesus? Uh, yes, I do. I, I believe in Jesus. Well, ma'am, well, the Lord just began to talk to me. He told me to buy all of the groceries for you. You mind about the that? You going to do what? I just going to buy all those groceries for you. But you've got to have a servant's heart to do that. Because if you don't have a servant's heart to do that, you're going to be like, please, they better get their own groceries. i got to do my own kids. i got to take care of this. But when you got a servant's heart, when you do stuff like that, guarantee you your cabinets, your food will never go bad. Why? Because God says, listen, I can trust you. I can give you more. Why? You won't withhold anything. You will do what I say. That's how the people of God in the Word of God were rich. That's why Abraham was rich. Jacob was rich. Because everything he put in their head, even down to Abraham's son. Think about what I'm saying. He wanted a son. But as soon as God gave Abraham and Sarah that son, God says, give me that son. Sacrifice him up to me. And then what did Abraham do? He started to do exactly what God could say. Then the Word of God says, now I know that you won't take anything from me. Now I know you won't withhold anything from me. So that means whatever I give you, I'll give it to you because you won't withhold it from me. You know it's not yours. Because the earth is the Lord's. And the food is thereof. And everything that there are there in, God owns everything. So for me to walk around like I own this, this is my car, my house, my money, my stuff, my job, my clothes, my this, my name. God says, okay, you think it's yours? Well, let me take it away and let's see what you got. Because if it's yours, you should be able to leave out here with it. When God takes your life and you don't have that next breath, you should have everything packed up into your big old beyond the cemetery and all up in this little casket, and you should be able to take that with you. That's right. But everything we have in this earth, in this earth you are not taking it with you. Right. You got to leave it all behind. Why? Because it ain't yours. Right. That's how they do it. It ain't yours. Tell your neighbor, it ain't yours. It ain't yours. I know it's bad English, but it's all right. It ain't yours. But God wants us to be hospitable in the house of the Lord. You can be in the midst of wherever you are. But God says, I will bless you if you just do what I say to do. And this is why. Look at what the scripture tells me. 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. I want to have a surface heart because look at this. And I'm going to treat people to the up respect. Why? Look at what it says. Don't forget to show hospi hosp hospitality to strangers. But some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. That there's some people in your life. You might have thought that it was the lady around the counter. You might have thought it was the brother sitting at the, at the light. You might have thought that it was the person, the pedestrian taking too long, or the old lady taking too long to get across the street. You might have thought certain things. You might have thought, you might have thought that the person at McDonald's or the person at Walmart. You might have thought, but it was an angel. What? That you were what? Look at what the scripture says. Entertain. So the way that you entertain them, God will begin to entertain you like that. So I'm careful how I treat people. Because I don't know who I'm entertaining. I don't know that if I see them again, you might be this person is just like this, but I guarantee you, one day that could be the person that you're talking to that be the one that will be giving you the job. Right. You walk up into that for that interview, you're like, oh, that's the lady I went off of. <laughs> oh, my God, that's the man that I, that I, 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 I gave him. I, I stuck on my middle finger. Oh, that's the man I just did that. You don't know who you're entertaining. That's right. That's right. You don't know who you're dealing with. Even when it comes to kids, you don't know whose kids that you're messing with. Right. You don't know who you're messing with. So I don't treat everybody like, I don't do certain things like that. I treat everybody the way that they should be treated. I give them the upper respect. I try to tell them. And even when they act evil, and when they, when they do wrong, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, Lord, bless them anyway. Right. Yes. Bless them, Lord. Because I don't know who I'm entertaining. Let me get ready to close. My third point is this. Everything we do, we do it unto God. We never want to do things unto men. We never want to do things for show. I'm not just doing when I give money or when I pay my tithes or when I give offering or I help buy a Thursday in the church. I'm not letting people know I just gave ten thousand dollars for what reason? They're trying to tell people that. What what they going to do for you? That's right. Whether you are a cook in the house and you're a cook. I ain't walking around like I'm the best cook. I ain't walking around like I'm the best person that know how to work on this sheet rock and do all this. I'm not walking around like I'm the greatest. I'm not walking around like that, like I'm the best singer. I'm best and I'm doing this and I'm the best. I'm the best Bible study teacher or the best teacher. I'm not walking around like that. I'm humbling myself. I'm doing something that God, God, you know what I'm trying to do. You know what I'm trying to do. That's why people have to do something with that thing because they don't want everybody to see. But when you do it, you do it unto God. You're not giving unto me. You're not coming to church for me. You're not trying to do this for your brothers and sisters for me. You're doing it unto God. So how I behave in church, what I do in church, whether I'm in church and I'm not got sleep, you're not doing it unto me. You're doing it unto God. God, I'm tired. Don't tell me. Tell God you're tired. But has you God done anything for you to make you wake up and praise God? To make you give God the glory? I'm not giving God no second best. I'm not giving God anything. But I'm in the house of the Lord God. So he allowed me to be here. And so the Bible tells me, and I'm hasten to close, the Pharisees, look at what the Pharisees did. These Pharisees, these religious people, so-called church people, people that walk around with their big Bibles, and they say, I'm saved, even apostolic, I got the Holy Ghost, but I'm looking at your life and the way that you are, your submission, and the way that you do, your attitude, your posture, all of these things, that lets me know exactly where you are. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Look at how these hypocrites, these Pharisees were when they talked about prayer. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the what? Hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. They want everybody to see them. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. God is going to reward them exactly what they're going to get. But the apostle Paul gives us the word in Colossians 3 and 22. And I'll close it right here. Look at what the word of God says. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. So I don't just do it according to when I'm in the house of God, but even my boss when I'm working. Amen. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance but ye serve the Lord Christ. You let us stay. So we are having our anniversary this Friday. There's going to be many people that are going to come here to the house of the Lord. 
saints of God, let's be hospitable. Let's be servants, saints of God. If I see a guest or a visitor coming, I'm going to allow them to eat first. If I see brothers, you see mothers and those who are, are, are women that are standing up, why don't you give them your seat? Let them sit down. Let them sit up so they don't have to stand up. Let's be servants. Let's help out. The other thing, I want to make sure that the house stays clean. And we need to let people know when they walk to the door, this is how we keep this church clean. Because we don't just allow kids to do whatever they want to do. We don't allow them to run and mess up stuff. We don't allow them to throw paper on the floor like this is some jungle gym on the outside. But we are going to let them know that we are the service of the Most High God. Yes. So let's be hospitable this Friday when they come to the house of the Lord. Let's be servants. And let's do it with a smile and with good hearts. Amen? Amen? We want everybody to be involved. We want everybody to help. That when somebody walks through that door, whether they are in a false church, somewhere in the Glade area, whether wherever they are, we want them to remember New Life Tabernacle. That you know what? I went to a church and there's something about that church that I gotta go back. Amen. Amen. So if you're here today, we say that we love God, but look at John 13, 34, 35, but this is it. And we're gonna pray and we're gonna leave here. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Look at verse 35. But this shall all men know that ye are my what? My disciples or my followers. You say you're a follower of Jesus Christ? But well, why don't you love your brother and your sister? Not about how they should be, but love them because Christ loved you when you were in your evil place. When you were doing what you shouldn't have done. Love them like that. And if you have love for one another, get what it says, you are my disciples. And so we want to love everyone that comes to this house. Amen? Amen? So let us all pray to ask God to give us servant's heart. And if you want to be baptized, because the only way that you can be a true servant of God, you must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. So there's somebody in here that has not been baptized, not in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, because nobody in the Scripture was ever baptized like that. And people teach that. But nobody was ever sprinkled. Nobody was ever baptized in the titles, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost in the scripture. They were all baptized, immersed in the water, and they did it in Jesus' name. And if you have not done that, that means your sins are still upon you, and you cannot go to heaven with sin. And so today, if you're here, you've heard truth. So you can't say, I've never heard it. God has said, if you need to be baptized to be my servant, you must baptize. The water is warm. We have clothes. We have towels. Why don't you go down in Jesus' name? It's not a coincidence why you're here tonight. You might have got invited by a friend, but God brought you here to hear the word of God. In Jesus' name. Why? Because he loves you. He's not going to let you say, Lord, you never gave me a chance. And so we want to pray. Ask God to help us. Let us all pray and bow our heads and close our eyes. Father God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for what we've learned. I thank you, Lord God, for blessing us, Lord God, here in New Life. I thank you for the true word of God. And I thank you for the love that is in the hearts of the saints. Father, this is in your church, God. This is your beloved. This is your baby here at New Life in Bell Lake. Father, we ask that you, Lord God, would Lord, exceed our expectation, Lord God, after this anniversary. I pray that, God, this church will grow so fast. Father, that there be love in this house for every sinner and every backslider. For one another, let there be no cliques. Let there be no schisms in this house, God. Let there be no envy, no jealousy, God. I bind it in the name of Jesus. I rebuke it and forbid it to operate into this house. Father, let us remember what you did. And let us, Lord God, follow in your example. Let us do it as you say to do, Lord God. We give you glory. We give you honor and praise. For this is the church of the living God that you have established in this city. For souls of man to be saved. Women, men, and Lord God, boys and girls and babies, oh God. For that soon coming day, you're going to crack the sky. And Father, you put a church, a preacher here, people here, to witness and tell other people what they must do to be saved. And to invite people to the house of the Lord. Father, let us carry ourselves like Christians. Let us carry ourselves like saints of God. As apostolic shall be carried, oh God. We give you glory. We shall be holy like you are God. We shall be perfect because our Father is perfect. And in the name of Jesus, God, we ask that you bless them. Bless every soul in this house. Bring it back to their understanding, Lord God. Help them remember this message. That on Friday.
Kanye, God, we be servants of the most high God. We give your glory, we give your honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Clap your hands up to God. Tell your brother and your sister right now that you love them. And God bless you. We'll see you back here in the house of God on Friday night. Be here at 730. We also